Today we're going to be talking about problem solving for neurological disorders. Welcome to The Pilates Show, where we explore creative and innovative Pilates tips and techniques to help deepen the skill level of the movement educator while having fun. I'm your host, Casey Marie Hertz, and today we're gonna to be talking about problem solving for your clients with neurological disorders. The Pilates Studio is a wonderful and safe environment for people with neurological disorders to come in and experiment with movement in a very controlled atmosphere. Now, your clients with um, head injuries, Parkinson's disease and the like, the world outside can be a very daunting, very scary place to try to navigate within. Think about what it would feel like to not have your full facility when you're doing things like walking down the street, um, being able to perceive and control your body just stepping off of a curb can be really, really difficult for clients that have impaired motor skills. Now, the other thing to think about too is that your clients that have uh, issues in this way actually can get very, very exhausted very quickly. This is a big key to understanding how to work with them. You might want to decrease the time of your sessions with them to 30 minutes, or sometimes you need actually extra time and actually extra teachers to help the, the client depending on the severity of their condition. Now, um, I like to really try to help the clients um, with lots of uh, extra sensory cueing. Um, they can get, again, very, very mentally and physically exhausted if we're using too many cues, if we're using too many cues too fast, if there is, um, if they're not understanding something right away, they might understand what you're saying to them, but then translating that information into an outcome can be a really, really difficult thing. So I'm gonna show you a few tips and tools that you can use that are very, very simple, that absolutely help to the client to connect the dots on how to make go from one step to two step to three step. Now, a lot of times what we like to do for our clients that have um, these disorders is have the studio to ourselves. Having a quiet, uh, focused space is really, really important so there's not too many distractions happening. So turn off the music, lock the door if you can. Don't have anyone else speaking or teaching in the room. This is gonna help them to feel safe and again, this is this idea of controlling the atmosphere around them so that they feel a little bit freer to move. Now, another thing that you wanna think about is this beginning posture. Um, what happens, especially with things like Parkinson's and, and um, also Alzheimer's and also head injuries, is that there's a default posture. What happens, because they don't trust how to move their body, they start to sink into their spine, they posterior pelvic tilt, a lot of times the shoulders roll forward, and then you get the neck jut forward. This is in part from the nature of what's happening in their signaling in their spine, but then also very, very fearful of falling or tripping or not seeing where their next step needs to be. They have to pre-plan every single piece of their life. So this is something that happens. For us in the studio, working on extremely simple, seated, standing, walking posture where they start to pull themselves out of that positioning can be a wonderful relief for them to feel their spine, to feel their posture, to feel like they can organize around themselves um, and find freedom of movement in that capacity. Now, again, a lot of times just the verbal cueing from a teacher isn't gonna be enough 
to help these clients transition out of this default posture. So what I like to do is to create tactile cueing, which you see a lot of in a lot of our work, but then also very clear, contrasting visual cueing. Now, over on the wall in front of me, you'll see that I have a simple poster board with three uh, orange post-it notes. Super simple, a dollar for the poster board. You probably have the post-it notes in your studio. What this does visually, it shows step by step where we want to take the client, okay? Because there's set the fluorescent on the white, there is no mistake of where we want them to go. If you just have a wall in front of them and say, climb your heart up the wall, say as a cue, it doesn't really show them where to go and have a goal set point. So I'll have my client sit down and a lot of times I'm going to have to help them into their seat or help them walk. Typically, again, we're talking about that default set point for, um, for this posture would be a posterior pelvic tilt and a slope. So I love the way that Elizabeth Larkham talks about the eyes as the eyes are the, the, the lead team for the spine. So first and foremost, I have them lift their gaze to look at that first lowest uh, sticky note. From there, I ask their eyes to climb to the second and third. So that starts a little bit of some cervical thoracic extension. Then from there, I ask them to imagine that they might have an eyeball on their navel or belly button. And this one actually works. They take the feeling of what they just accomplished with their eyes here, and they try to bring it to the front of their body. So sometimes I even touch them here or have them hold here and say, okay, so keep your eyes on your head at the top, post-it note, but then can you bring your belly button eyeball to the bottom one, to the second one, and maybe can you shine it to the top post-it note. Now again, this might take time, breath changes, and even some easy soundings that can help to stimulate their diaphragm to help decompress all of the organs in the abdominal cavity would be fantastic for them. Um, again, standing behind your client, giving them cues through their shoulder girdle would be amazing as they start to focus and bring their attention upward, okay? Then what you can do once you've practiced that is we're gonna take this and flip it. So you can take the same stimuli that they're used to looking at. They know that's their goal. It's been imprinted into their visual field and we change it sideways. From here, if your clients can effectively organize that posture, what we can do is get light springs, bungees, or therabands into the hands then we ask them to see if they can get their belly button to the center post-it note. It's gonna stay locked in there. Then from here, depending on any arm work that you wanna do, you can have the right arm reach for the right post-it note and back. And then the left arm reach for the left post-it note. You can also trick it up a little bit, have the right arm go for the center post-it note and back and opposite. You can create any pattern on that, on that nice poster board with the contrast of the post-it notes to get the clients to maybe even bring the hands together and apart. You can draw circles. 
What this does is it gives them a place to reach towards while receiving the information from the spring to help organize their shoulder girdle. These things can be so helpful when you're trying to get your clients with these issues to understand and start to feel an easy, upright, seated posture. Because you have to remember as these issues progress in the body, they are doing a lot more sitting than somebody that doesn't because that is a safe place to be. It's a wonderful place to work for them because they do spend so much time there. Now, an extra thing I wanna show you that can be wonderful is gait training with the post-it notes. So I'm gonna move this here. So walking, again, can be very daunting, very scary, especially when they don't know where they're going. And um, one of my good friends and, and colleague, colleagues, Anne, she did this for one of our clients with Parkinson's and I just thought it was absolutely brilliant. So I wanted to share it all with you. So what I'm gonna do is create a yellow brick road for walking and for gait with these post-its. So these post-its on the floor, high contrast to the dark floor, bright yellow, you can set a path of movement for your client. And their goal is not to do this quickly, but to hit every single post-it and gait. So they'll start with one, and again, you might need to hold on to them to help support them so that they don't fall over or they feel safe, but they're gonna try to walk and hit every post-it note place because what happens a lot of times is they default into a shuffling of the feet and they don't pick up their feet to make the next move. That is going to increase their chances of tripping and falling not even on stairs, but just like the lip of a rug or transitioning from a wood floor to carpeting, right? And so this work, very slow and diligent to pick up a foot and walk is wonderful training to keep them upright and safe and moving forward regardless of what's happening in their body. Here we have a question from Anne from our forum. I have a client who's a regular marathon runner. Right now she's training and runs about 40 to 50 miles a week. She continues to practice Pilates to lengthen her spine, but also has difficulty lifting her legs in a straight leg position. She has very tight quads, but it's not tight at the top of her hip, the hip flexors, which I find interesting since she runs so much. When attempting teaser, the pull of her legs pulls her back out of flexion as she rolls up. I'm looking for some assessment moves to help determine what is missing in this equation and some exercise to help strengthen her hip flexors without utilizing her quads. I've tried the hip flexor strengthener on the reformer on the long box on her back with straps around the knees. She feels the abs and low back, but not the flexors. And thank you so much for writing in with this question. Uh, this can really stump people uh, having somebody who puts in so many miles and yet their hip flexors seem to be weak. So there's a few things going on in her body, chances are, that you could kind of play with. First of all, with somebody running so much, usually what happens is that the psoas becomes tight. Right? So the psoas attaches on the inside of the spine and then goes in through the iliacus, blends in, and then inserts into the lesser trochanter on the inside of the femur. What happens when that gets tight is that it brings you into an anterior pelvic tilt. Okay, so this can be what you're seeing when she's going up into teaser. The reason why she can't have that little bit of flexion in the lumbar spine to help counter the weight of the legs is because she just goes and shortens right into those. And if you think about what she's doing on a weekly basis, this makes sense, right? The kidneys and the adrenals in their connective tissue bag sit right on top of the psoas because she's taxing her body so much in the running, it tightens that whole complex and really becomes rigid in that area. Now, 
what we want to remember is that usually tight muscles are weak muscles. So we want to really start to access the psoas, which is your deep hip flexor. Now, as for why she can't straighten her legs in teaser, I'm also guessing she has some pretty tight hamstrings. So you're gonna wanna go ahead and really fine tune some release work in the hamstrings, the side hip, the lateral hip, also some opening of the abdominal cavity and you can check out how to do that. It's all over our site, but then also on the practical release work workshop, that's a great place to get lots of tools to put in your tool bag to help your athletes start to open up their body and truly cross train, um, letting go of what they no longer need so that they can become more efficient. But I wanted to show you an exercise where you can start to deeply train the, the deep hip flexors in the body uh, while staying out of the quads. So first things first, posture is everything. Finding that easy neutral position is really important, especially for somebody that's using their body so aggressively. Chances are they're gonna be very rigid in their lumbothoracic region because they're also taxing their diaphragm so much. So that area where that inserts into the spine here is where, again, it's the meeting place of the diaphragm and the psoas. So what we're gonna do is use the smart spine pillow here create a little ramp. This is essential into getting the back ribs to drop and descend into the floor without force. That's gonna help to sling all of the viscera back into the body to create that beautiful T8 anchoring that's so important in your neutral spine and neutral pelvis. And you're gonna wanna keep an eye out on this area while doing this work. So I'm gonna lay down here. The other thing that you're gonna wanna do, and notice this is not a head pillow, this is a shoulder girdle pillow. So I'm lining myself up to lay down so that I'm not arched here, but I allow my body to find ease and drop to the floor. And I probably need to be right about there. So then I'm gonna take another hand towel and place it underneath the lumbar spine, probably just opposite of the belly button, maybe a hair lower. For me, that works out perfectly. So in this position, I feel my lumbar spine supported by the hand towel. And again, I can get my rib cage to descend and hang into the floor without force. Very important for your runners. Now, I have two bands here. You can use their bands or you can use, um, with these we order online. You can also just put a ball between the knees. But what I want you to do is band their thigh to their shin. Anything that works to keep this connected. This is going to turn off the quadriceps so that we can really focus on the deep hip flexors here. From this positioning, you can do all of your pre-Pilates foundational work, keeping balance in the pelvis as you bring one foot up and down. This is work that is so important for so many people. And the, re the magic in this work really is the banding. You have to remember that if you go into a tabletop leg, you're floating the weight of the lower leg and foot up. That's calling your quadricep muscle sartorius into action to create this movement. The minute you drop the shin, all of a sudden, the body has to figure out how to purely move the femur, and that's how you're gonna start to access and work the deep hip flexors. Now, as your client does this, I really wanna point out, a lot of times, of course you're gonna see shifting here, but what you will really see is that you start to arch the back to do this. That's when you know it's a tight, weak psoas that is inhibiting this movement of staying neutral. So you can have them hold on to their sternum, drag it down, and do the work from that opening up the back ribs 
to do the movement. That's what's gonna give them their gorgeous core connection that we're always looking for, runner or not. That's it for today. If you have any comments or questions that you'd like to see answered in an upcoming episode, please comment below on Facebook, Twitter, or our forum. See you next time and never stop learning.